Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and dear participants, uh, we have uh, just listened to two presentations, one by Ambassador Lisa Varnakwi, Executive Director of CISS, who has uh, set down the theoretical basis for confidence building measures and also referred to some specific CBMs between India and Pakistan. And then we listened to an authoritative uh, statement uh, by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee of Pakistan's position and policies in the face of a growing threat from India. In my remarks, uh, what I will do before I discuss the contents of the book by Dr. Asma Haja. To touch upon <clears throat> the international, political, military, and economic outlook, which appears to be eroding rather than building trust and confidence among nations. In that context, uh, we will see how the relationship between India and Pakistan is developing, and then we will discuss the contents of the book itself. The international scene today is uh, <coughs> complex and fast-changing. Relations between major powers are in a flux. The established order of the world is under challenge and new battle lines are being drawn and new equations are emerging with some countries like India enjoying the bliss of being quoted by all sides. <clears throat> For example, India is a member of the BRICS which includes Brazil, Russia, China, South Africa, and India, a member of the SCO, a member of the Russia-China-India dialogue, and also a strategic partner of the United States and has been described by the United States as an anchor in its Indo-Pacific policy to contain China. <coughs> It has the good fortune to escape American sanctions despite its purchase of S-400 missiles from Russia and a waiver from the United States for continuing to purchase oil from Iran despite American sanctions. Today there is a clearly defined and declared retreat from globalism and multilateralism. The world is moving away from reconciliation and cooperation and moving towards economic sanctions, trade wars, and even military confrontations. There has been a sea change in international relations after particularly the advent of Donald Trump as the President of the United States. Unfortunately, both in the United States and Europe, a kind of a siege mentality has also taken over in political and in economic affairs. This is manifested in the growing opposition to people seeking refuge either in the United States or in Europe <coughs> from Asia and Latin America in the increasingly protectionist policies being pursued by the United States and the unilateral withdrawal of the United States from multilateral agreements and commitments. President Trump's speech at the United Nations General Assembly this year was unambiguous. He declared his country's preference for independence and patriotism over global decision making, thus giving a clear message to the international community that the United States would continue to follow 
its unilateralist approach. There is also a shift to the far right, not merely in the US but also in Europe. In Germany, the Merkel era of liberal and human, humanistic approach towards the refugees is coming to an end and the far right and anti migrant parties are gaining strength. The recent election of an ultra-right candidate on the pattern of Trump, Trump as the president of Brazil is another indication of the reversals being suffered by liberal ideology and policies. Right-wing populism is gaining ground. The far-right populists are pro-nativism, anti-immigration, anti-elite, anti-politics, anti-establishment, anti-intellectual, anti-system, and anti-so-called authoritarianism. But they themselves are authoritarian in the sense that their slogan says, if you are not with us, then you are against the people, since we represent the people. The ultra-nationalist, xenophobic, and anti-Islam or Islamophobic policies being pursued are growing. Neo-fascism is rearing its ugly head both in the United States and Europe. The West itself has been responsible in very large measure for the death and uprooting of millions of innocent civilians through armed aggression and widespread destruction in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, and also in Yemen. And when these homeless people seek refuge elsewhere, they are given the neutral title of being migrants and refused entry. As we know, Trump has deployed the US Army on its border with Mexico to ward off what he and Fox News described as an invasion of the United States by a few hundred bedraggled, poor, and politically hounded people from Central Latin America traveling together for their safety to seek refuge in the United States. Let's look at the world briefly. In the Middle East, Israel continues to annex more and more Palestinian land and killing people in Gaza and the West Bank with total impunity. In Yemen, the Saudis and their friends have continued to wage war and aerial bombardment for more than three years with the active logistic support and weapons provided by the United States and Western countries, with the result that thousands of civilians have been killed and more than 14 million people are threatened with famine and disease. In Syria, more than 350,000 people have been killed and millions rendered homeless, seeking refuge outside Syria because the Western countries wanted to bring about a regime change in Syria and financed, trained, and provided weapons to extremist groups to fight the authoritarian, but yet a non-religious, secular Syrian government. Iran is in the gun sights of the United States and its allies in the Middle East, particularly Israel. The unilateral withdrawal, U.S. withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action regarding Iran's nuclear program approved by the United Nations Security Council and faithfully implemented by Iran as certified by the IAEA and the imposition of sanctions against Iran in the vital area of oil exports, shipping, and banking are designed to choke Iranian economy. The U.S. is demanding the strengthening of the nuclear deal, limitations on Iranian missile program, and non-interference by Iran in Syria, Yemen, 
and other countries including Iraq, <coughs> Lebanon, and Palestine, etc. The U.S. is also threatening economic measures against other countries or corporations doing business with Iran. This is an undisguised effort to bring Iran to its knees and effect a regime change in that country. The United States also appears determined to start a new Cold War. The resignation of Russia and China as the major adversaries of the United States in the U.S. national defense strategy and the building up of U.S. nuclear arsenal, the imposition of sanctions against Russia, the trade war with China, and the building of alliances against China in the Indo-Pacific are clear signs that the United States is using all means at its disposal to maintain its domination and its position as the sole superpower of the world. The U.S. is going back on agreements it had entered into, for example, it renounced recently the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia, claiming it to be a relic of the Cold War. President Trump also declared that the United States would build up its nuclear weapons arsenal till, according to him, these people, meaning thereby, presumably, Russia and China, come to their senses. The United States is building alliances in this rivalry, competition, and confrontation with China and has declared India as an anchor of its strategy in the region. If this trend continues, Pakistan may be seen by the United States to be in the opposing camp because of our strategic relations with China. And there are some indications, which you are all aware of, that perhaps this is already beginning to be happening. <clears throat> the confrontation between China and the United States is a classic example of a struggle between a status quo power and a rising power referred to as a Thucydides trap. As a strategic partner of the United States in this region, India seeks to emulate American policy of domination through threats and bullying of smaller South Asian neighbors. India has acquired the pretensions of being a big power and is following in the footsteps of the U.S. in its disregard for international law and the United Nations while simultaneously coveting a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. In its desire to be seen as a power with an outreach beyond its borders, it claims to have carried out so-called cross-border surgical strikes on the pattern of the United States in Myanmar <coughs> and in Azad Kashmir. And General Zubair, of course, informed you about the so-called deterrent patrol of the Indian nuclear submarine in the Indian Ocean. India has also seen rapid saffronization under the BJP, <coughs> which is a branch of the <coughs> RSS. The appointment of Yogi Adityanath, an extremist and rabid Hindutva acolyte, as the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in the Indian Union in terms of population, is a clear sign of the ascendancy of RSS in BJP decision-making. Many see the yogi as a possible successor of Modi as the leader of BJP. The extremists have taken center stage in India and are unlikely to give up their salience in Indian politics. The Congress does not have a charismatic leader to lead it to victory. And we should also be clear in our minds that on vital issues like Jammu and Kashmir, there is a national consensus in India and the policies of Congress are in essence not any different from those of the BJP. 
They may be less violent, but the fundamentals remain the same. India is also not responsive to Pakistan's initiatives for a dialogue on Jammu and Kashmir and on all other outstanding issues between the two countries. It takes shelter behind its false accusations against Pakistan of terrorism and claims that terror and talks cannot go together. India has been on a killing spree and committing the best, worst forms of violations of fundamental rights of the people of Kashmir for a very long time, but particularly since the martyrdom of Burhan Bani and the champions of human rights in the West avert their eyes and remain silent. And now we come briefly to the book that we are discussing by Dr. Asma Khadr. The book being launched today looks at the history of the bilateral <coughs> relationship, the issues of Jammu and Kashmir, the water issue, and then discusses the military and nuclear CBMs, measures for forging economic interdependence, track two efforts, the role of the media, and the role of spoilers, and concludes with some thoughts regarding the future of the relationship. I will merely note that the book could have benefited greatly from a thorough editing. Since it suffers from errors of syntax and phraseology, which break the flow of the reader. I have also found that generally the editing of books written in English and published in Pakistan <coughs> leaves something to be desired in terms of correct editing. But the book is a very useful compendium of all the CBMs which have been agreed upon through the years between the two countries as well as the present status of the dialogue and the present status of the implementation of the CBMs already agreed upon. Distinguished participants, there is a substantive body of evidence to demonstrate that India has been responsible for aggression against Pakistan even after the Simla agreement. And I refer to Siachin, to Khmer and to Chorbutla on the line of control, as well as for subversion inside Pakistan. It has repeatedly broken off dialogue with Pakistan, has gone back on the agreement of 2005 that acts of terrorism by non-state actors will not be allowed to disrupt the dialogue process, and most recently has forced the indefinite postponement of the SARC summit to be held in Pakistan, despite the fact that SARC is a purely economic cooperation organization which does not discuss political issues. The vitriol and venom against Pakistan being aired on Indian TV channels is building up a huge anti-Pakistan sentiment among the uninformed Indian public. The shrieking and the frothing at the mouth of Indian television anchors when talking about Pakistan is dangerous for the future relationship between the two countries and the two peoples. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has recently declared during a discussion at the Davos in the desert in Saudi Arabia that the government of Pakistan will wait for elections in India next year before it takes any fresh initiatives for a dialogue. If there is no dialogue, clearly there can be no discussion on CBMs. To conclude, relations between India and Pakistan are in a deep freeze, and given Indian policies are likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Inam. Our second reviewer is Ambassador Ashraf Jahangir Kazi. Ambassador Kazi is an experienced diplomat, 
who has served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, China, Russia, then East Germany, and Syria. He was also Pakistan's High Commissioner to India. He was United Nations Special Representative in Sudan and United Nations Assistance Mission in Iraq, and also carried out diplomatic assignments in Copenhagen, Tokyo, Cairo, Tripoli, and London. Sir, you have the floor. pleasure and honor to come after some really fine speeches, particularly by my friend and colleague and our former foreign minister in Amul Haq, General Zubair, and the brief comments of Sarwar Nafi to speak about some aspects of the book, which is a fine book, Shaking Hands with Clenched Fists is a valuable contribution to the study of confidence building measures, CBMs, in the context of India-Pakistan relations. It is not just a valuable reference work, it also provides a most useful analysis of the background, context, possibilities and limitations of CBMs across the range of India-Pakistan relations. These, of course, have been mentioned here. Yeah, the Jammu and Kashmir dispute, and CBMs relating to them, water, etc. And as such, I would like to offer my sincere congratulations to Asma for having written such a valuable book. India-Pakistan relations today are rooted in history, atrocities, conflict, antipathy, mutually exclusive narratives, and the domestic politics of both countries. These are immensely powerful factors they overwhelm what the people of the two countries share in terms of language, culture, centuries of coexistence, interchange, and mutual influence. Confidence building measures, as the author says, need to be carefully designed to alleviate and modify the lasting impact of mutually negative perceptions and instead to build possibilities for eventually transcending them. In this regard, leadership and the quality of governance in both countries have, a, have not have been up to the mark. The leaders have been either unwilling or incapable of addressing this challenge of overcoming deep-rooted, mutually negative perceptions and trying to build up a climate in which deep-rooted problems can be effectively addressed. <coughs> Given the life and death challenges of the 21st century, including the looming threat of nuclear conflict, climate change, water scarcity, loss of cultivable land, population growth. Pakistan's population is expected to be over 400 million by the year 2050. Food insecurity, massive dislocations of people as a result of these factors. It is absolutely essential to prioritize 
possibilities for mutual understanding, even in the most unpromising circumstances, as is the case and has, has been dwelled upon by the speakers, for bilateral and regional